So we are looking at the bread of life, and I should have mentioned earlier on that uh, the message is so obviously appropriate for the Lord's Supper, um, and I didn't want to stand up here as I seem to have done uh, quite, recent, quite frequently in, in recent weeks and say, well, it's a pity we don't have the Lord's Supper twice, uh, because this would have been really appropriate uh, for it. So, um, so we move the Lord's Supper to this evening, and... Uh, God willing, by the time we get there, it, it will be, as it, as it always should be, um, a very special season for us. Uh, but let's get into this subject now. And um, I, I'm going to take an interesting route through the subject to end up at John chapter 6. But we won't get there for a little while. Uh, it's certainly true that since the fall... Uh, there's been a cherubim and a flaming sword that God put in place uh, to protect the way against man getting in uh, to eat of the tree of life. And uh, man since that time, in his folly, has tried to find a way to dodge past the cherubim and dodge past the sword and get back into the garden and take uh, the fruit of that tree by his own efforts. And you can look at a lot of what goes on in this world in that light. As, as men in their foolishness trying to obtain eternal life by their own efforts. And California, I believe, is probably the place where that folly has reached new heights um, over the last few years. We all seem to think here or act like we can live forever. Plastic surgeons come and, uh, and do their work so that the effects of the years can be hidden. Or we can use cosmetics uh, to try and hide the signs of aging. There are approximately one million special diets that you can put yourself on. There are billions of dollars spent on nutrition research, all of which will promise you that a certain food may help you to avoid a certain type of cancer. Of course, that also means they may not. All of these things are promoted and peddled to you and to me with the promise of an extended life. Sometimes it's just implicit, may prevent some kind of cancer or, or help to repress it a little bit. Sometimes it's explicit. Uh, some of the more scurrilous and, and uh, unscrupulous things that are said, claims that are made for certain approaches to life. I think it's very clear that, 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 that you, you should expect, if you do those things to yourself, that you're going to hang around here a little bit longer. In fact, forever. We're never going to die. Um, <clears throat> exercise plans. It's the same deal. Uh, you can sculpt the perfect body Men, you can have that six-pack that uh, we're all being taught to dream of that we might have it as our own one day. Apparently, it is the best thing that you can have, or those pecs uh, and various other parts of the anatomy that I won't go into. And it all contains an unspoken assumption that this life is essentially all that there is. And that it's going to go on and on and on forever and ever. And you can have eternal youth if you've got the right surgeon, the right diet, the right exercise program. Um, it's going to carry on. And these things are very popular. Why are they very popular? Because we're trying to get past the sword and past the cherubim and get that tree of life on our terms. And not on God's terms. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that physical exercise can't be beneficial. 
Um, although after the exercise I've been doing in this last week, I'm starting to question that myself. <laughs> but what we tend to do is, is to ignore the 100%, absolutely 100% failure record of every man, woman, and child who has ever lived, with two exceptions, Enoch uh, and um, Elijah, people who were taken into heaven without dying. Everybody else has died. So what kind of fools are we if we think that these programs are going to somehow help us to avoid what has happened to 100% of humanity? And the point is, if we put our hope of eternal life in a diet plan or an exercise program or a plastic surgeon, we're going to be very, very disappointed because those things can't give you life. They can't give you anything close to life. Now, we're looking at the names of Jesus and uh, tonight we're going to look at the bread of life. There's an implicit promise uh, right away. If you went out into the world right now and said, what's the bread of life? I think they'd probably say, well, it must be a high-fiber, gluten-free wonder loaf made, of course, with sustainable agriculture and ethically produced from organic cereals. Because that's how we've been programmed to think. And that's bound to add years to your life here on earth. Sounds really good, the bread of life. Is that what Jesus meant? Is that what we're supposed to understand from what he said? Well, no. It isn't, obviously. So to get us to what Jesus meant when he called himself the bread of life, we're going to take a little tour through Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and we're going to look at three things. First, that the manna that came down from heaven pointed very clearly to Jesus. And that second, that Jesus is the true bread from heaven, that the manna pointed to. And then lastly, so what? What does it mean to me or to you that Jesus is the bread of life? So first, uh, the manna from heaven pointed to Jesus. Moses led Israel out of slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness. And a whole, at least if, if I'm reading the text correctly, a whole six weeks later, they were grumbling because they had no food. They got really hungry. And they turned to Moses six weeks after the Lord parted the sea and led them through and covered Egypt's army with water. They turned to Moses and said, it would have been better if we'd stayed in Egypt and died there by the Lord's hand. But you, Moses, you've brought us out to kill us in this wilderness from hunger. Now, as a parent, I know what I would have done to my child if he'd said something like that to me. And, and, and so you might imagine what God would do to Israel behaving like that after such privileges and such blessings. But instead of venting his, his righteous and just wrath upon them, he gives them something very special. Uh, he gives them manna. Uh, something like wafers appeared on the ground six days out of every week for them to go out and, and collect so that they could eat it and live. Uh, and the manna is described for us in, in a couple of places at least. One of them is Exodus 16 and verse 31. The house of Israel called this substance manna. And it was like coriander seed, white. And its taste was like wafers with 
honey. And then Numbers 11 and verse 7. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance like that of bdellium. This isn't a strange place to start to look at the subject of Christ as the bread of life because the manna was pointing to Christ. Like Christ, the manna came down from heaven to earth. Like Christ, the people didn't know what it was. They didn't know who he was either. In fact, the name manna means, what is it? They'd never known anything like it. Their fathers had never known anything like it. It was completely new. The manna was white and apparently unleavened. It speaks of purity. And of course, Jesus had no sin. He was the spotless Lamb of God, Son of God. Uh, being a wafer made with honey, it was very sweet to the taste. And uh, who is sweeter to the taste, spiritually speaking, uh, than the Lord Jesus Christ? Being like coriander seed, it had a very fragrant aroma. And we know that the aroma of Christ is, is of, uh, spoken of as, as something to do with life and, and something very special and very pleasing. Uh, the appearance like bdellium, that the commentators seem to think that that was either some kind of very precious resin, like myrrh, which was very expensive, or a precious stone. Um, either way, it was uh, semi-transparent and, um, and very precious. And of course, uh, it was a very gracious gift. The people didn't deserve it. They, they'd done everything they could not to deserve it af after the way they treated Moses and through him uh, the Lord. So it was gracious, and it was life-giving, because they were starving. And uh, if that manna hadn't arrived, uh, they would have been dead uh, fairly soon. But like Christ, and this is something we're going to dwell on a bit later on, the manna was no good for them as long as it was just lying on the ground. Uh, they had to go out, they had to gather it, and they had to prepare it and actually eat it in order to live. God gave them manna. And for all these reasons, they were supposed to see beyond the wafers to the one that the wafers were pointing to. They were supposed to see Christ represented in the manna. And they needed to trust in him through the manna so that they might not just live physically, but live spiritually. That's why it was given. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 explains that for us. You'll know these words. He, that's God, humbled you, that's Israel, and he let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. This is a message of life. There was a message of life in the manna. The manna was supposed to tell them that it wasn't just bread that was going to make them live. That could keep them alive physically for a while until sin uh, had its effects and their bodies perished. But there's another life. There's an everlasting life. And the manna was supposed to tell them about that. If they could see the one that it was pointing to. And it was pointing to him because... What is it that comes from the mouth of God? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by everything that comes from the mouth of God. It's the Word of God that comes from the mouth of God. And who is the Word of God? 
It's Jesus. So what is being said here is man doesn't live by bread alone. You live by the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who proceeds the word from the mouth of God. That's how John introduces Christ to us. It's interesting. We'll we'll look at both his gospel and his first letter. Uh, John's gospel, chapter 1, the first four verses. In the beginning was the Word. We all know who that is. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Then 1 John chapter 1 and the first verse. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The word and the life are bound together. This is what proceeds from the mouth of God. This is what the manna was supposed to teach Israel. Don't just fill your stomachs with a few wafers that are here today and and gone tomorrow, and all they've done is kept your body alive. Look beyond them to one who can give you eternal life, one who is the Word of God, the Word of life. They were supposed to know that they were to be as dependent upon Christ for eternal life, resting upon Him alone for that life, as their bodies were dependent upon this manna to keep them alive in the wilderness. It's not enough to eat physical food. All that can do is keep your physical body going. You have to have spiritual food as well. That's what Israel was supposed to know from the manna. But they didn't understand it. All they could do was use the manna to fill their stomachs. And they never combined faith with the manna in order to see Christ and have eternal life. And so they died. With two exceptions, every last one of them died in the wilderness. Well, now we come from having seen that, that uh, that the manna pointed to Jesus. Let's see next that Jesus is the true bread from heaven. And that's where we come to our account in John chapter 6. We're going to read through, and I'm going to comment as we go, beginning in verse 26. But first, a little bit of context, and the context here is absolutely critical. At the beginning of John chapter 6, you'll see that Jesus just fed the 5,000. He had five loaves and some small fish, and he fed 5,000 men, and there were probably women and children as well, so perhaps uh, 10 to 15,000 people. And they were all fed out of a few small loaves of bread and a few fish, and they picked up 12 huge baskets full of the pieces that were left over when everybody had eaten as much as they could. Well, then the disciples go down to the boat. Jesus goes away because they're going to make him king by force, and, and uh, that's, not his, uh, that's not what he wanted to have happen by any means. And uh, the crowd realizes later that, wait a minute, uh, the boat's gone and Jesus wasn't in it. Where is Jesus? And so they start a search for him. And they come across to the other side of the lake because Jesus has walked on the water and joined them in the boat and they've arrived at the other side. And, And this crowd, I think, fairly quickly gathers. They rush round to meet 
uh, Jesus again. But the point is, as Jesus opens this passage by telling them, you are making exactly the same mistake that your fathers made. Because you're not here for the true bread, that the, the manna signified, if you like. You're here because you had a, a good meal and you want to fill up your stomachs again. You're not interested in the one the sign points to. You're just interested in the here and now and in having a full stomach. And Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Don't be like your forefathers. They were working for the food that perishes. You need to be working for food that endures to eternal life. Therefore they said to him, well, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? It's a good question. You say we've got to work for food that endures to eternal life. What is that work? What is it that we have to do? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Believe in the one that the signs are pointing to. He's the one who's got the life, the eternal life, and he can give it. Trust in the ones, in the one that the signs point to. And then they say perhaps one of the most, there are some pretty astonishing things in Scripture, but this has to be one of them, one of the most amazing so they said to him, what then will you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They were just on the other side of the lake where he took five loaves of bread and fed maybe 15,000 people. And he's talked about their need to believe in the one God has sent and to do this work of, of trusting in him. And the next thing they're saying is, well, give us a sign then. Give us a sign. And what's even more amazing is that maybe subconsciously they seem to realize that what Jesus did when he fed the 5,000 was very reminiscent of the episode with the manna, because that's the next thing out of their mouths. Still going on about a sign. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Well, yeah, they'd just eaten bread that, that the Lord Jesus had miraculously created for them. They were in a bit of a wilderness on the other side of the lake. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat, and they, by he there, uh, they had Moses in mind. They thought this was something Moses did. Uh, but obviously the sign that Jesus had just given them wasn't enough. I don't know what would have been. Jesus has to correct them. Verse 32, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. He didn't give you the manna. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus corrects them. It wasn't Moses who gave the manna, it was God. And by the way, God is also giving you the one the manna pointed to. And you should see that. And they said, well, this, this actually uh, sounds pretty good. Uh, this bread that uh, comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. 
we could probably use a bit of that. And so they say, well, give us this bread. Always give us this bread. And then we get to our text. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. And here's the burden of what he's saying. Your forefathers didn't believe on me when they had the manna given to them. They ate the manna in the wilderness, he says in verse 49, which, which we're not going to get to this evening. They ate the manna and they died. And I'm convinced he means they died spiritually. They were never made alive together with Christ. Because he says, this is the bread that came down from heaven that a man may eat and not die. It's spiritual life. It's eternal life that he's talking about here. And they didn't look, back in the day of Israel, beyond the manna to the one it pointed to so that they could feed their souls and live. They didn't find out that if they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that hunger in their soul would be taken away. They would be satisfied with him. They didn't realize that Jesus is the true bread from heaven. Not the manna that was supposed to point to him, but the real thing. Now come in order to give life. And he goes on in the next few verses uh, to expound upon this a little more. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Wonderful words. There isn't any doubt in what he's saying there, is there? He's absolutely certain, and of course, he can be. He came from heaven to give life to all who would believe on him, to all that the Father had given to him. And he can do this because he has life in himself. That's what he says in John 5, 25 and 26. Truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And if he has life in himself, he's able to give life. That's what he said just now in, in verse 33 of John 6. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And uh, later on again in the chapter, uh, he tells us that his words are words of life. John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. And then verses 67 and 68, so Jesus said, this is after uh, the Jews have got offended by this message. We, how can we eat this man's flesh and drink his blood? What, that's a hard word. We can't accept this. And they, they turn away and, and leave him. And, and Jesus, in this moment of, of great pathos, turns to the twelve and says, 
You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. See how all of this hangs together? The word of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who proceeds from God, the one who has been given life in himself, the one who was pictured and represented by the manna, he is the one that if you put your trust in him and do the work of God, which is to believe on him that God sent, he is the one who gives eternal life. That is what he meant when he said, I am the bread of life. And whoever eats of me will not die. Eat on him. Believe on him. And he will give you eternal life. Well, so what? So the man appointed to him. So he is everything that the man represented. He is the real thing. He is the true bread. So what? Well, as he said, it's quite simple now. If you eat of him, which means believe on him, do the work of God, then you will live eternally, spiritually. Otherwise, you perish. Well, how shall we eat of him and live? It's all a matter of faith, as I've said, believe on him. That's the work by which we have life in him. It's not a work we do. That that believing on him is faith that is given to us by God. We can't do it ourselves. But that is what Jesus says is what we need to do in order to have this life in Jesus. But let's just work through the analogy of eating, because I think He calls himself the bread of life for a reason. Let's just work through that briefly and see what we might learn about how we can know that life for ourselves. And it all starts, eating all starts with hunger, doesn't it? We all know what it's like to be hungry. Um, And if it carries on for any length of time, it's very painful and it can be quite debilitating. We get very weak. We have an aching void somewhere in the middle of our bodies uh, that's crying out, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it gets very hard to focus sometimes on anything except that desire. Well, it's the same in spiritual terms. Is your soul aching tonight? Is it, does it feel like a void? Does it feel empty? You know that it's not the way it ought to be. You know it needs to be filled with something. But it's aching. It's just a void. Well, from what we've seen tonight, you'll know that Christ alone can satisfy that hunger. Uh, And as Jesus says in, in John 6, verse 35, he who believes in him shall never hunger. So is your soul aching for him? If it is, then you are in the right state to feed on him. Let's think about the satisfaction that comes from eating. How can I stop the aching in my soul? Believe on Christ and trust in the work he did. How do I do that? Well, here are some do's for how to feed on Christ. Uh, See Christ, the God-man, coming to earth living a perfect life. See him broken on the cross. See him buried. See him rising from the dead. See him ascending to the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And having seen him, this is what we do with food, isn't it? We see it first and then we place it into our mouths. Chew on him. By which I mean meditate on Jesus. On his words, the words of life, on his life itself, on the things that he did. His are words of life. That's what Peter said. And they are. Chew on them thoroughly. Do the job properly. 
You know, there are people who seem to think that Christians are, are kind of saved and, and, and fed by osmosis. Like they sort of sit there and it sort of and, and somehow they're, they're alive. Or, or it's by IV, you know, you stick, stick your arm out, in goes the needle, and then you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about chewing and any of that inconvenient stuff. It all happens through a tube. We get zapped. We were talking the other night about let go and let God, and it's, it's a bit like that. It's like we don't have to do anything. Well, you do. We have to do the work of God. We have to chew. We have to believe by the grace of God, but we have to do it. We have to know him. We have to know his, uh, from the scriptures, we have to study them to know him in them. To know him better, to meditate on him. How can we believe on him if we don't even know who he is? If we never read, take the trouble to read the word and, and, and see him there and, and, and know him better. And like food for our bodies, we have to depend on him for our soul's life. Without him, our souls will perish. I said earlier on, and, and I'll repeat it now, the manna was no use to Israel as long as it was lying out there on the ground. And when the sun came up, it pretty soon disappeared. If you just stood there and said, wow, that's a pretty good crop of, of manna we've got there today. Look how it's glistening in the sun. Isn't that nice? You know, that manna is really wonderful. It's white and it's sweet and it smells good. I, manna is just a wonderful thing. If you stop there, you would die. And it's the same with Christ. If you just stand at a distance and say, oh, what a wonderful man he was. Such a tremendous example. Look at, at how he felt. Look at how he treated Mary and Martha, how he wept at the tomb. And, you know, it just gives me a, a, a warm feeling. He, he was such a, just such a tremendous man. You're going to go to hell thinking like that. If that's where it stops. And if you never actually take him into yourself and believe on him, you're going to perish. Just as Israel would have done if they'd never gathered up the manna and eaten it. Your soul is dependent on him for life. Having chewed, swallow. Take him down into you so that he lives in you. So that he becomes part of you. Feed on him until you are full. This is an all-you-can-eat deal. Eat all you can of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be a glutton here. And, and it was true with the manna. The person who gathered as much as they can, you can imagine somebody sort of staggering in, oh, great food at last. And they ate it. And they didn't have too much because you can't be a glutton where Christ is concerned. You can't have too much of him. Eat as much of him as you can and then digest him. He must permeate every part of your being. He must become part of you. By God's grace, the most prominent and visible part. He will give life and strength to your soul. Those are the do's, very quickly if you don't. Don't be on a junk food diet, as far as this is concerned. There's no life here. We talked about it earlier on, cosmetics, diets, workouts. All of those things done for a body that's got 70 years on the clock, or that's about as many as we can count on. Can't count on any, really, but uh, most of us wear out if we live that long at about 70 or 80. What's the point of all this stuff we do to try and make ourselves look 20 years younger? Supposing you could extend your life three years from 85 to 88. Is that worth it for all of this care and attention? It's just, it's just a body. It's just a tent. It's only made for the here and now. It's not made for glory, it will have to be transformed for that. This is what Jesus calls laboring for the food that perishes. 
when we spend so much attention on our bodies. It doesn't satisfy the hunger of the soul. And it takes away, like junk food, it takes away your appetite for Jesus. That's the worst thing about it. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Don't be spiritual anorexics. You know what anorexics are like? They don't want to eat. They won't eat. And there are some who are here tonight in that condition. It's like the Jews speaking to Jesus, and he's telling them, eat of me, eat of me, and they're saying, no way. We don't want anything. This is too difficult for us. Give us some more loaves and fish, and that'll, that'll do the trick. Don't be spiritual bulimics. That's the condition where you deceive everybody by being present and eating, and then you go away in secret and throw it all up. It's like somebody who may have made a profession of faith here on the stage and said, yes, I love the Lord Jesus Christ and I intend to follow him all my life. And then they go out into the world and they throw that up so that they can get back into working for the food that perishes. And you never see a change in their life. You never see them grow. You never see them look more like the Lord Jesus Christ than on the day they made their profession of faith. How can that be right? If you're feeding on Christ, there must be growth. There must be life. We must be able to see it. Well, just a few words to conclude. Uh, a good friend of mine told me yesterday that to make a loaf of bread is an act of love. And uh, she does this regularly for her family. And, and she's right. It takes a lot of effort to make a loaf of bread. And uh, you're doing it with the people who are going to eat it in mind. And it's a demonstration of love and of devotion. Now imagine somebody has done that for you. And they come in and it's still hot out of the oven. You know what bread is like. It's marvelous. And they slice it with all of that love in their hearts. And they offer it to you. And you say, oh, no, thanks. I, I just had a Milky Way bar. I'm not hungry. Uh, maybe I'll have a piece of next week's loaf. How do you think that person would feel? After all the effort they went to, to prepare the bread for you. Well, what are we going to say of the one who has prepared the bread of life and sent him to the cross and offers him to you once a week, more than once a week sometimes? And you say, no thanks. I've got a new video game I want to play. No thanks, my favorite TV show is just coming on. No thanks. I don't, I'm too tired. No thanks, it's, uh, it's just not good timing for me right now. Tonight, the bread of life is offered to you again. Are you going to take him? Are you going to believe on him? Are you going to live in him, he is the only way to live. Take him into your soul. Depend on him for spiritual life. He won't disappoint. He's never turned anybody away. We read that earlier on. Whoever comes to him, he will not cast out. Why will you not come to him tonight and have eternal life? Let's spend a few moments in quietness and let's respond to what I trust the Lord has been saying to us uh, through his word.